All right, thank you all for being here today. My name is Beth Torres, and I am the head of our strategic accounts for Evidin, which is part of the Atos Group. Now, you all have heard of a cloud-first organization, those leading businesses that really embraced cloud as uh, the backbone of their operations. Today, we're seeing a transformative shift towards an AI-first. An AI-first organization is going to deeply embed AI into every facet of their business, including decision-making, customer interactions, or even product offerings. However, with this transformation are some inherent challenges, such as making sure that you have high quality data and that you are developing the right AI resources so that you have ethical and transparent processes. With me today, I have Kevin Davis, who's CTO of our AWS Business Group for Eviden. And I have Eric Terrell, who is our AWS Cloud Lead for Atos. All right, so let's dive into this super interesting topic. Kevin, we're gonna start with you. Can you share with the group what it means to be an AI-first organization, and how is that any different from just simply adopting AI tools? Yeah, so let me phrase this up in uh, basically a, a why AI-first, really kind of what AI-first means, and then try to give you an action item that everybody in the enterprise space can run with leaving here today. So the why is really around, um, I think we've heard some of it this week, like the, uh, the startup ecosystem is really driving us towards, or, or they're going really quickly. They see this as an opportunity to disrupt the enterprise incumbents. And um, as, as we see that occurring, um, what they're doing is they're building new products with AI built into literally everything that they build from the very foundation up and everything that they do. So what we're seeing with the enterprise space is that they have their legacy products and then they're bolting on AI. And usually that comes in the form of like a chatbot or something like, hey, I've got my, my legacy, this is the thing, my digital thing that I've had for all these years and I've bolt on a chat bot and off we go. We call it AI and we keep moving, right? Um, so with that disruption occurring, we see the real opportunity for us to come back to the scenarios where we really need to drive um, our enterprises to become an AI first organization so that they can innovate more rapidly. So what it is, what AI first organization is, is essentially uh, think about um, preparedness, uh, operational preparedness for AI and gen AI. So it's organizations who have set a, an AI strategy to enable, to build a platform so they can enable their organization broadly, their business broadly, to rapidly develop their use cases so that they're not spending time on that uh, differentiated heavy lifting of establishing the, um, the, the foundations of what, of, of like data procurement, for instance, right? So they're not having to do all of that on every single use case that they go out and attack. They're able to really just focus immediately on uh, the, the use case itself and then measuring that ROI and get there really quickly so that you can do what you'll hear me say a lot uh, all week is get to a place where you can fail fast, experiment and move um, and find the, the right use cases that turn over new revenue. Um, yeah, and so what you can do today as you leave as an enterprise uh, customer out there, you can set up an AI office or an AI center of excellence, a great first step with a remit for that crew to go out and establish this platform, um, do you know, get the data in to a place where it's governed 
Um, so and then centralized and, and uh, really allow the rest of the organization to pick up from that platform and then build their, um, their generative AI uh, products from there. All built in from the ground up. All right, Eric, we're gonna shift over to you. Um, can you share some examples of an organization that is AI first and what has really set them apart in doing so? Yeah, I can. So thank you today, thanks everybody. Um, well, the, the one that immediately comes to mind is, is obviously Amazon, right? They, they use these products uh, for the broad group of companies that they have whether it's the, the one you know mostly is Amazon.com and their retail unit, which they've been using AI for several years, obviously built upon a, a long-term capability that they've had in machine learning. What we see specifically with AWS uh, is baking AI into it, everything they do. So the announcements you've seen this week are uh, you know, Qdeveloper and, and other extensions in terms of code transformation and other things. That's, that's making the headlines, but then you look at an operational capability and see that you know, Q and, and other things uh, will likely make a big disruption in the observability space and in the operations workflow. So another company that's using you know, AI in, in most everything they do is actually Atos and, and Evidence. Yeah. So we, you know, when, when Gen AI became somewhat mainstream and, and we, we had the availability of these tools come online, there was definitely a lot of limits and we didn't wait to start experimenting and, and taking advantage of some of the tooling. Were they mature? Were they capable end to end? No, but we started building with them. So early previews and use of uh, AWS Bedrock and and other tools, and foundational models, LLMs, etc. You know, at, at start building our own RAG frameworks and all of our own pipelines before some of the agent capability was there and, and other things. So, you know, I've always said with with cloud, the best thing you can do is start using AWS today, right? You're, you're gonna be able to make better decisions when you understand the tools and capabilities. So we've actually done that. We've built applications for our internal systems, contracts, legal, you know, looking at, looking at uh, HR processes, things like that. Obviously, workplace productivity, we, we use the mainstream AI tools for that. Um, but also helping our customers transform. So building AI and the tools that we have for that transformation and then the you know, day two operations and managed services that we provide for global customers to help us more efficiently um, communicate with our customers around service issues and things like that. Uh, but also, you know, be able to think about how they'll build in applications and that. So we've, to that end, we've launched a Generative AI Studio in, in Pune, India. Um, that's to help our customers get the learnings from us and start building applications, prototyping, accelerating what they do with that. So ultimately, those are all examples of how, you know, adoption of AI has to be somewhat of you know, you, you have to do it, you have to build the muscle memory from practice and exercising those things. And so that's what we've challenged ourselves with as an organization, much like AWS, is to say, how do you, you know, gain maturity in something if you're not using it? We have to get out of the, you know, say analysis paralysis or waiting for the next iteration of the tool for it to do 100% of what we want. How can we use it today in a modular framework and really build on that. So those are some of those examples. Yeah, yeah. One, one quick add there, like to exactly what Eric was just saying, it's about getting that place where you can fail fast, measure an ROI, fail fast, and get to that next use case. Um, our, we've done that a lot already, and then uh, we're trying to get our place where our customers are able to, great, I'm glad you brought up Pune, because that, that's a great place for us to be able to experiment with our customers give them a place, a safe place to go do that, find out what, one, what works, and two, where, how quickly we, they can turn an ROI on uh, for a given use case. All right. So data is often cited as the backbone of everything to do with AI. So gentlemen, I, take turns, because I'd love to hear <laughs> from both of you, but 
what are companies experiencing as far as data challenges and what can they do to overcome those challenges to be truly AI first? Right. Yeah, so, you know, data has gravity. There's a lot of issues with uh, legacy systems, legacy data stores, etc. This is not a new problem for AI, right? This has been a problem uh, <laughs> that the customers have faced prior to cloud and every system. We like to hoard data, we keep it in old formats, it kind of stays there, it's not transformed. Um, and so really making sure that uh, the data is, is you know, applicable, clean, uh, it's um, cataloged appropriately, we have the proper tagging, metadata. Um, so, so that's not a new thing, that's come along, but it's always been kind of the long pole in any kind of data transformation. Obviously, AI is a data transformation yeah. at its heart. Uh, and so really being able to do that. I think the other thing is the security of that data. So again, you know, uh, the way we looked at the world is if we bake security into our foundation, so our team you know, lays down an initial production-ready, secure, governed environment that we call the Landing Zone Accelerator. This is built on Amazon's Landing Zone Accelerator. That's a core service for us to enable our customers, whether they're internal customer teams or they're you know, customers that, that we manage their workloads in the cloud and really help them um, uh, make sure that that's secure. And then the, on top of that is making sure that that's connected and we're using tools that allow us to you know, bring that data together in a lake, be able to not have to go through extensive ETL and other data cleansing to do that uh, and ultimately make sure that that reliable data is then used as a source for training and, and the other yeah. NAI capabilities to make sure that you know when we develop an application uh, you know we can rely on the outputs of the data yeah you know it, one of the you somewhat unique challenges to the enterprise space is that enterprise customers have all these silos of data. Um, whether it's in an ERP or a CRM, you know, and you, you, every one of those individual ecosystems kind of guard their data. Um, and to really be effective with this as an AI first mentality, you're gonna have to centralize that data and uh, that you're going to, have to build a lot of trust with those data stakeholders. Then, you know, you think about your data, your governance, um, governance frameworks, and those types of things. That you're going to have to have that centralized, but still hold those uh, hold those tenants true in order to build that trust. And, and uh, you know, that that's how you'll get to the place where you can build these custom models, uh, or maybe your your fine-tuning existing models or, uh, or doing the retrieval augmentation implementations with that data. Uh, but again, like it has to come in. And it's kind of interesting, like one of the things that we saw announced this week is, you know, we used to talk a lot about the ETL and cleansing and uh, especially with unstructured data and bringing it in. And you know, now we've got announcements that, hey, maybe we just need to get the unstructured data in and we can actually build things with the unstructured data because AWS is, given us tools that will actually structure that when at build time. So <laughs> yeah, and uh, I it's think, kind of fun. You know, one thing to add to that, if you take an extreme use case, I, I like to take this and say, do um, you think anyone is running Gen AI on a mainframe? Not on the mainframe, but <laughs> replicating that data to AWS enables you to run Gen AI on what yeah. otherwise would be considered very off limits, you know, legacy operational data. So if you can, you can think about it that way, that's getting the data to where the Gen AI is. Because again, I'm not adding, you know, uh, NVIDIA and other chips to my, you know, uh, LPAR or whatever. I'm going to, you know, really need to go to the cloud to have that availability. And so that's really a, a good example of how we see, you know, even if you're running a legacy application, you don't have to modernize, migrate everything today in order to take advantage of Gen AI but you do need to have access to the data to be able to do that. Yeah, look, being cloud first makes it a hell of a lot easier to be AI first. That's just the reality. True. <laughs> All right, so ethical considerations are apt 
absolutely essential. So, gentlemen, what is important to consider from an ethical AI standpoint that all of these customers should be thinking about each and every time they want to do something in the AI space? Yeah, I'll kick this one off. This is, um, in, in, in my MBA program, we had business ethics class. That's right. I've, in my EE program and any of my CES programs, I've never had a technology ethics class, right? Like, this is a new, new reality that this uh, generative AI technology is kind of brought to us as developers. So, yeah, we've got to think about it now. And my framework for that is to think about it in terms of um, kind of a three-layered approach. Uh, I'm thinking about it at build, like when I'm building my, my uh, or augmenting with the data, when I'm building the models, um, and then I'm thinking about it again in a framing of at um, you know think guardrails. So uh, you know so, so when when I'm making calls to the uh, to the model, I want to think about it. Then I want to have a framing there, and we have tools to to solve that, um, like guardrails. And then I want the the next phase of that is as good as guardrails may ever be, we're always going to need to monitor what, and use tools to monitor what the generative AI is actually giving to our users on the other side of that. You know, it, it'll vary depending on the type of interface, right? The kind of the more open, chatty the interface is that you're interfacing with your AI on, the, the more risk you've got to kind of manage around that. So being able to have a tool there to sit right up on top of it so you can monitor what happens there and take course cor uh, corrections um, once things and, and have a response plan essentially so that you can retrain and, and get that stuff out of it if it does happen. That's, that's just a great idea. Uh, I think a different perspective or an added perspective to that is you know, ultimately we have ethical responsibilities, whether that's customer data or uh, generative data that we're, we're putting out into the market if we're an information system that people rely on. So the security of that, when we're talking about, say, uh, healthcare data and information, we have some healthcare uh, Gen AI apps that we've, we've developed and deployed. Um, that, that customer specific data, again, has to be secure and I do have to make sure that when we're planning for the application lifecycle and the data integration, we have to make sure that we're training, we're looking at the data to make sure that um, we're not given uh, results that may compromise the customer because you know we're we're taking something that should be private information and putting it out of there. Part of that's a security component, but obviously segmenting the data. Again, these are. These are examples of how Bedrock and other parts of the AWS ecosystem help to shelter that data. Um, again, we have to make sure that ethically the data is accurate, so the various training processes need to be a part of the innovation tool chain to make sure that you know production or the definition of done for an, an AI application is not, do I query something and get a result, or is my prompt you know, look like how it's supposed to look, we really have to look into that data and make sure that the data we're getting back is is, is both private and secure, but also accurate. And, you know, does you know, misinformation is, is a broad news problem we <laughs> see, but, you know, on smaller scales or even at large scales in the enterprise, it's really important to uh, be a good steward of that data. And uh, within your, you know, Chief Data Office or just in the data science group, those are really critical components of the workflow. Sure. I think you make a very interesting point that we don't have these ethical considerations as a part of our education curriculum. I think we're gonna see that evolve it's very quickly. To. Yes, yeah. it has to. All right, well, thank you all. Both of these gentlemen are experts at delivering GenOps solutions to our customers. So please do not hesitate to pick their brains. We're at booth 775 uh, and their contact information is on the slide. Thank you all for being here today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here at reInvent. Thank you. Thank you.